Hello, I'm Azzurra Messina. I'm 17 years old and I'm from Milan, Italy. In my opinion, we're heading towards a future where food production, both animal and vegetable, will rely substantially to the uh, technological methods being developed to aid us. This new approach will facilitate the growth of the sector, it will meet the needs of a growing planetary population, and when it will promote eco-sustainability. Let me give you some examples. We have the utilization of microbes that will combat and protect flora and fauna uh, from parasites and illnesses. We have robotics that are intelligent machines that will help us to, um, that will spray and plant, that will, sorry, <laughs> that will spray uh, autonomously so to reduce the use of uh, chemical substances and to to reduce chemical substances. We have aquaculture. Aquaculture will go algae, breed fish, and will calm illegal fishing while conserving the habitat. Imagine milk without cows. Milk being created by inserting casein into, uh, casein into genes. <laughs> In conclusion, we have, in conclusion, te uh, technology will uh, increase the quantity and quality of our food while safeguarding the earth and uh, uh, its products and uh, her inhabitants for generations to come. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're having a great afternoon. I believe that a transformation of the food system has already started. It has the potential to create healthy food for society and the planet. Driving this are both innovation and emerging technologies, which represent a great opportunity to tackle some of the greatest challenges in the food system. But nobody can do this by themselves. We all have to work together. All the different actors in the food system need to put their resources together to tackle those challenges. Bringing a diversity of different players, actors in the food system together is exactly what we at EIT Food are doing. I am Andy Zinga. I am the CEO of EIT Food. And I think it's a great moment to speak to you about the way we can change uh, we can, about how we can change the way we eat through technology solutions. But first, let me share something about what more, a little bit more about what EIT Food is. We are basically the largest formal innovation ecosystem in agri-food in Europe. We bring a diversity of different players together that have a kind of a safe harbor environment where they can do things in the pre-competitive space and in spaces that are nor where normally market failures occur. And uh, what we do is we bring together uh, uh, players like large corporates, smaller businesses, research centers, and universities, and also consumer organizations. But we also work with an excellent, excellent ecosystem of food startups, agri-food startups. We call them the rising food stars. They're organized in an, in an association which is um, an uh, association that covers everything from production through processing all the way to nutrition health. With this ecosystem, together, we're, we're changing the way that food is both produced and also valued by society. And we're really lucky in that the European Union is a great supporter of this. In fact, we're getting funded with up to 400 million euros over the next seven years to make projects happen that are extremely well aligned with all of our strategic objectives that all play into things like reducing food waste, uh, things like educating the next generation of food scientists, creating more businesses in this space, attracting more investments, and all of that. And 
When you think about it, agriculture and food are really at the heart of many of the societal challenges we're facing today. This goes way beyond just SDG number two that deals with hunger. It, is actually, it actually has an impact on sustainability, on health, on access to healthy food. So it, ha it, has, um, it has a lot of different aspects to it. And we believe that a transformation is needed to change the way the food system, uh, the, to change the food system so it is fit for purpose. If we play our cards right, we believe that we will create greater food security, uh, greater health for people, more sustainability, healthier planet, and healthier people. Now, at the beginning of this talk, I said changing the way we eat. Now, in Europe, you may ask yourself, why should we even think about changing the way we eat? Being that in Europe, Europe is the home to many of the world's best diets, like the Mediterranean diet, for example, that's been practiced for hundreds of years. So why even bother? Well, here's a shocking little, um, sh shocking little report for you. So the World Health Organization looked at the prevalence of overweight and obesity in 11-year-olds. And if you look at this chart, you will see on the left-hand side where there's Greece, Italy, and Spain, they are way up on top of uh, the scale. So the prevalence of, of overweight and obesity in those countries amongst 11-year-olds is actually quite high, even though all those countries have been applying the Mediterranean diet for centuries. So the question is, do we know how to make the right food choices? And can we deploy technologies to help us making the right decisions? Well, we believe that we can, and we also believe that it's worthwhile trying. For example, through online courses such as this one, Understanding Different Diets. We want to make food education available to everyone on the planet, really. And to that end, we are building an inclusive and innovative community uh, where the consumer is actively involved. In fact, what we want is we want full transparency and communication across all the different actors in the food system. This is at the heart of what we believe at EIT Food. A big part of this is, oh, okay. A big part of this is a platform that we call Food Unfolded. Through Food Unfolded, we, uh, we make sure that people have access to science-based and accurate information about food, the way food is made, produced, and foods, food technologies. And, um, and we, we want them to also understand and be more engaged so that they know what is, what is right, what is wrong, what can be applied, what shouldn't be applied. And let me just show you a quick video of Food Unfolded so you get a feel for what it is. And by the way, I also have a folded carrot here, which is this. So let me share it with you. Hey, what do you think of when you hear the word food? How about technology? Now, what do you think of when you put them together? Food technology. Did you know that pasteurization is considered a food technology? Or field plows and greenhouses? Or the process that freezes your fruits and vegetables for your next smoothie is also food tech? Food and agricultural technologies are a part of our daily lives, whether you know it or not. Without food tech, the products we eat, where and how we eat definitely changes. We share with you the latest and oldest food technologies. We'll take you through how things are made, why certain processes are used, the pros and the cons, alternatives, and basically anything and everything about food tech. We talk with farmers, experts, food producers, and manufacturers, and we also want to talk with you. So unfold your mind, learn the whys and hows of food technology, and take a peek into the future of food.
here again, we, we have this platform. We are a neutral instance. We have no interest over and above just informing and engaging the consumers. Again, all in the spirit of having better informed, more engaged market actors in the world. But we believe that besides informing, we also have to engage and listen to the consumers and to all the different market actors. Now, consumers might have real difficulties assessing whether food technology solutions are actually have inherent risks, and they also may have a problem assessing what the benefits of them are, right? So that's where trust comes in. We at EIT Food developed a so-called trust tracker. So this is a platform whereby we measure every year how trust changes across different categories. And with our trust tracker, we found the following. When you look at four, a cluster of four different market actors, farmers, manufacturers, retailers, and authorities, we found that consumers have the most trust in, what do you think? Who would they trust the most? Farmers, of course. But within that even, when you look at the farmers, the consumers, when a, farm, a farmer is large, again, they have less trust in them than in the smaller ones because they see the profit motive in the larger farmers. At the same time, when we looked at industry itself, the food industry, it tends to score very low on the trust scale. This is something that we at EIT Food are addressing. We're looking to not just measure it, but we're also very hopeful that over the years of our work, over the next 14 years or so, the trust will keep going up by all the good work that we'll be doing together. So let me share with you a couple of sound bites of people that were in the trust tracker panels. For example, this gentleman, James, a 24-year-old from Carlisle in the UK. He said, I think it's hard to trust big organizations to make decisions which are best for the public because their main aim is to make money. Now, James, as you can imagine, is not alone in, in, uh, in, his, uh, in his view. He's not alone in thinking this. We found that generally people are much more trusting, as I mentioned just a moment ago in the, in the context of farms, in smaller organizations because they feel, they see them as more involved and caring about their individual goals. So going on to another uh, voice. So this is Angela from Toledo in Spain, a 22-year-old uh, lady who said the following. She, she said, we used to trust in food blindly, but now we are that we are aware of the real situation, we feel concerned. So people like Angela represent sort of like this new generation of consumers, consumers that are more conscious of what's going on, that see things a little more critical than the pr previous ones, and consumers like, like her need to be informed thoroughly and, uh, and reliably in order to gain their trust. Now, it stands to reason that if you, inform cons if you involve consumers earlier in the product development process, that you can gain their trust, right? So, for example, we had a panel in which we looked and shared with the consumers information about vertical farming. And vertical farming wasn't some, some of the uh, audience, some of the panel members weren't familiar with vertical farming, and they were a little bit distrustful. But after we started talking to them and sharing with them what it actually is, they began to say, wow, this is really interesting and it could be a solution for the future. And they were extremely interested not just in the here and now, but in looking at how that evolves over time, which means it is important to engage with consumers, not just now, but to stay engaged and to keep informing them over time. So the big billion euro question then is, what actually is healthy food or a healthy diet? Well, the answer is complex, yet totally simple. It is different for, we're all different people, right? So we all come from different backgrounds. We have different, different needs, different tastes, different ages, different access to food, different genders, etc. So food, for it, for it to, be, uh, to be the right and healthy food, needs to be tailored to the individual's needs. This is something that we're actually investing real euros in right now. We have a project whereby we're, we're, helping, uh, we're helping consumers 
get access to personalized nutrition technology, which helps them to make the right choices on food for themselves and also be able to be connected to healthcare pro uh, practitioners who can accompany them on their journey to a healthier self. This is one example of something that we're doing. Secondly, we also need to have tools to compare the, uh, to compare the nutritional value, but to also understand what is the environmental impact of the food that I'm actually buying or consuming. So consequently, we also invest in the technology whereby consumers can choose whether they go for a product that has a higher nutritional value or a higher or a lower CO2 footprint or both. So this is something, this solution will probably be rolled out already this year in 2019. So this is one of our success stories that we're quite proud of. But we fundamentally also need to look at uh, and consider how food is produced. So dairy is uh, very much, uh, sorry, so dairy products have come under uh, increasing scrutiny lately because of their impact on the environment. And here again, uh, as an example of a project that we've invested in, uh, we, we have a technology that we're working with that will both reduce the, um, the uh, saturated fats and at the same time reduce methane emissions from livestock. So innovation and food technology can actually deliver. Now besides these projects that we do in our, in our uh, ecosystem, we always, almost always involve our excellent uh, rising food stars, the startups that I mentioned before, and I just want to give you a quick overview of three examples. Dumatok is one of our partners in the network, a startup that's created a way to reduce sugar content while at the same time having the exact same sugar feel, sugar mouth feel, uh, and such like. So they're involved in a project whereby we want to reduce the sugar content in biscuits while at the same time keep it really tasty and, and interesting. And uh, this is working right now and is again one of the success stories in the network that we've created here. So, and the really great part is there's no, there's no basic, this is all clean label. There's no chemistry involved. This is all about the way that the sugar crystals are grown. Imagine that when you sh swallow sugar, 90% of the sugar kernels that you're taking in are actually never tasted. This is what they're changing. They're making sure that there's a larger surface area so that you do taste the sugar more and have uh, actually more fibers too. There's another one, which is GrainSense, um, a company which helps us to uh, do data analytics around uh, different cultivars of grains. And with that, we're, we're observing where do these cultivars grow the best, which are the, least, uh, which are the most drought resistant, et, et cetera. And once we have all the data in, we're also going to teach farmers on how to apply this technology and the insights. And then lastly, Ipsicon is a, a company from Spain and into industrial technologies, and we're working with them to find a way to reduce fat in, uh, in all kinds of foods. And we're doing this by looking at technologies such as ultra-high pressure sterilization and UV thermal pasteurization. Now, <clears throat> all of those, so food technology solutions, however, we believe need to, de to, to do more than just provide calories or, sus or a more sustainable footprint. <clears throat> we believe that there are many, many additional things that need to be looked at, namely things like consumer choices, the pricing, the consumer responsibility, and all of that. This is what we are particularly strong in, is to take a systemic and holistic approach to the way that, that uh, the food system is transformed. We don't do this by ourselves. Again, we at EIT Food are working with this excellent network of partners, and we invite all of you to be part of this journey. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, how are you doing? It's great to be here today. Uh, my name is Richard Parr, and I'm the Managing Director for Europe at the Good Food Institute. We're a not-for-profit organization which works to promote um, plant-based uh, and cell-based uh, meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood. And today, I want to talk to you 
about how you can start the next billion dollar plant-based or cell-based company. What we've seen recently with Beyond Meat is just incredible. It debuted, it went up last week, and this is just, this is fresh information from yesterday. Uh, it's, it's gone up even further again uh, on the back of a recommendation note from a Wall Street analyst. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying that it's a, it's a 3.8 billion US uh, market cap at the moment. This is incredible. Uh, and this is the first time that a, uh, a plant-based um, meat alternative uh, has reached the market and we're seeing the incredible response uh, that people are giving to it. That's awesome. But I think that the next uh, founder of the next um, billion dollar company could be sitting right here in this room or perhaps watching on uh, YouTube. And today, I can't tell you exactly how to do it, but I want to give you some tips and hints uh, that maybe you can follow uh, if you want to try to follow in the footsteps of this great organization. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about why we should uh, be thinking along these lines. And I think there are, uh, there are four main reasons for why you might want to get involved in this space if you're not already. Firstly, of course, uh, is the planet. Everyone here loves our planet. We've only got one of it. We need to protect it. Uh, and we're familiar with um, the uh, impact of our current uh, unsustainable food system uh, on it. Secondly, of course, animals. We love animals, uh, and we know that they're not treated right by the current food system. Thirdly, health, our own health, and public, human public health in general. We're seeing the rise of antimicrobial resistance, uh, we're seeing um, food contamination, et cetera, and we know the problems with that. Uh, and then last but not least, financial security for ourselves and for our families. Let's be completely clear, there are enormous uh, commercial opportunities here. Uh, both in the plant-based and the cell-based um, space. Uh, and those opportunities, I think, are pretty much uncapped. Um, even if, uh, you know, we've seen what's happened with um, plant-based uh, milks. Uh, it's gotten to about 10% of the market, and that, that in itself uh, is, is enormous. If we could even get to 10%, 20%, 30% in some of these other categories, just imagine the rewards that will be available. Now, how should we go about doing this? This is the absolutely key graph that I want to focus on today. And this shows different countries in the world and the types of animal protein that they consume. And what you can see there, where the arrow Beyond Meat is, shows the area of the market that Beyond Meat is focusing on, which is in the US, obviously spreading out, uh, but it's in, the, it's in the beef sector. Now, as you can see there, that is a small, that's a tiny proportion of the total uh, quantity and value of animal protein that is currently consumed. So if Beyond Meat can get to 3.8 billion, just taking that little piece of the pie, just imagine what can happen when people start getting really serious about creating quality, price competitive products in these other sectors. And I want to pick out just a few things to look at here. Um, obviously, dairy and eggs are enormous, um, and in developed markets, uh, uh, chicken and poultry, chicken, very uh, important. Uh, and then look up, look at, for example, like a China, and look at the big blue bar there, that's pork consumption uh, in China. Absolutely enormous and increasing as uh, incomes and population rises. Just imagine the commercial opportunities and the wider social opportunities of innovating in that space and coming up with some really quality products there. Just imagine the impact that could have. Bacon. At the moment, we've got awesome, awesome, awesome uh, burgers, plant-based burgers. We've got some really good pork um, products as well, but I think we can do better. Um, and I think that the first person, first organization that creates a really tasty uh, plant-based or cell-based bacon uh, is going to, if you'll pardon the, pardon the very bad English pun, uh, might just get to bring home the bacon, which means successful and, and make a lot of money. Um, seafood, absolutely enormous. Absolutely enormous sector ripe for innovation. Uh, again, good products available at the moment, but let's be honest, we're not at the level um, that Beyond and Impossible and others are in, in beef. So I think that uh, seafood is an incredible opportunity. Uh, poultry, chicken, but also turkey. Um, there are, again, good products available, but we can do better. Uh, and if, if you're interested, if food scientists, entrepreneurs, whatever, 
if you're thinking about how you can really crack into a big market, maybe this could be a good way to go. And then cheese. Who doesn't love some nice, uh, some nice tasty cheese? And we've, we're getting the, the quality of plant-based alternatives, plant-based products, plant-based cheeses, really improving rapidly. Uh, fermentation, better textures, et cetera, improving taste. But we haven't quite cracked it yet. We're not quite there on the delicious taste of an extra mature cheddar or something. Uh, but I think if we can get there, and when we get there, um, we can uh, definitely assume that there'll be some uh, big opportunities. But also, I think, why should we cap ourselves? Why should we say that the ceiling that we, should, that we can't go above is the taste, the mouthfeel, the texture, the, the, the satisfaction uh, of these conventional products? One of the great things both about plant-based and about cell-based technologies uh, is that we can, we can aim higher. Um, and maybe that's the next big market, is to find something which uh, doesn't just mimic these products, but surpasses it in different uh, factors, whether that be uh, in, in taste, et cetera, uh, or whether in the kind of ancillary uh, you know, nutritional composition, et cetera, uh, or perhaps other factors that I haven't even considered. So I think we can go even further than this. That's one set of things to think about in terms of if you guys want to uh, create some amazing companies and, and do a lot of good and, and get rich. Um, but there are, there are two other avenues as well, I think. Uh, and this is a quote from uh, Andy, who just spoke before me, um, who rightly identifies that there are about 30,000 varieties of edible plants, but right now only about 7,000 of those are actually used by humans for uh, mainstream consumption. And then if we think of the kind of the big, you know, your soy, your pea, et cetera, obviously we're relying on an even smaller subset of those. And there is an enormous world of opportunity out there um, in these products which uh, exist in nature, but at the moment aren't being properly and fully utilized, uh, and their potential isn't being uh, taken advantage of um, to innovate and to create delicious new products. So again, I think that's one front that's worthy of exploration uh, for people who are interested in making progress in this space. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the sort of back-end uh, technologies, um, uh, formulation, processing, protein sourcing, etc. So there's a whole bunch of things we can think about here. Now, I think that this industry is at the stage that Steve Jobs and Apple was in 1976. Believe it or not, this, this is not like a fake thing. That is the first Apple computer. And, if you, and I think we are at, that, we're at the equivalent of that stage in the plant-based and cell-based industries now. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit beyond that. But you see the point. Who could have, imagine if you had a time machine and you could go back to 1976 and you knew what was going to happen. Um, you know, you get into the, the microprocessor, the software industry, uh, and you do really well. Well, I think that we, have, uh, we are very credibly in that kind of position uh, that you would have been back then in the late 70s uh, with the IT revolution, with the food revolution now. And I think people that get, on, get in here on the ground floor, and, and we are still, if we're not on the ground floor, we're, we've, we've just left the ground floor and we're two centimeters above it. I think there's a lot of space for people to get in at the beginning uh, and be the next Steve Jobs, be the next Bill Gates uh, in this space. We want to help you do so. The Good Food Institute is a not-for-profit organization, uh, and we work on a variety of issues to try and champion and advance these uh, exciting opportunities. Uh, we do things like we publish these recently published state-of-the-art industry analyses of cell-based meat, plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy, which gives you the real lowdown uh, the market intelligence and the analysis of what's happening in these spaces, where the opportunities are, et cetera. So very much recommend that to you. Uh, we've, got, we've published specific papers like this uh, on seafood, just honing in on that uh, opportunity that I uh, identified earlier. Uh, we've published a startup manual, which gives you a step-by-step -step guide to how you can uh, jump into this space uh, and start adding value. Uh, and we organize uh, every year in early September the Good Food Conference. This is the leading global um, conference bringing together scientists, companies, we got amazing speakers, USDA, Tyson, Kraft, Heinz, Kellogg's last year. Um, and this brings together players from uh, all aspects of the industry uh, in order to strategize, to share ideas, uh, and to work out how we can make progress. And uh, I should say, I should go back and I should say that obviously, uh, all of you are very warmly invited, uh, and uh, for a limited time only, uh, we've got a, uh, a discount on the ticket price down to uh, 500 US, 
uh, for anyone flying in from overseas. So get them, uh, get them while they're hot uh, and come join us. Uh, and I should also uh, put, a, uh, put a plug in for the excellent uh, team at ProVeg, uh, based in Berlin, but working all across uh, Europe. And they do fantastic work in this space as well. Uh, and they, they do corporate engagement stuff, and they also run the amazing ProVeg incubator, which takes uh, startups uh, in this space uh, and gives them a flying start. So all, get in touch with all of us uh, if you want more. And I just want to come back to this. You know, look at that. Look at the... Look at the space that's available there. Beyond Meat has done incredibly well, but it is, it is grabbing one subsection of, of a small subsection of the total market for uh, animal protein. There is untrammeled, untapped opportunity out there, uh, and I think it's just there for us to seize, uh, and I hope that together we can do so. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, everybody, and uh, uh, I'm really happy Andy gave a nice introduction. Uh, I'm Jody Puglisi. I'm a professor of structural biology and biophysics at Stanford University, and I'm going to tell you a simple story. Um, and like many simple stories, this one has a happy, for the moment, ending, um, and some morals and some lessons uh, to teach you. Um, because for the last five years, uh, beyond my day job, I've been helping to build and uh, advise and put together the approach uh, beyond, uh, behind uh, Beyond Meat, which you've heard a lot about, which makes me laugh a little bit. Um, so you, you, this audience doesn't need to know the question, which is, of course, how are we going to feed the growing population um, in the world? Um, and in particular, the issue of meat consumption, uh, which in the Western world is still quite high, but leveling off but is exploding in the developing world. As countries mature economically, uh, there's a desire to turn to more protein-rich uh, meat-based diets. Uh, and as you all know, this is a disaster uh, across many fronts, uh, including health-related issues, as I'll talk about in a moment, environmental land use issues. It's absolutely not sustainable. I don't think I need to tell this audience that. Okay. Um, and so what our approach at Beyond Meat was, and we really set off to do this a few years into the founding of the company, uh, was to try to recreate the experience of, of eating meat uh, using all natural plant-based uh, materials. And the, the underlying arguments or morality of doing this, I think, again, are familiar to everyone. Uh, there are issues of uh, animal welfare of land and resource use, uh, water waste, uh, of climate change. Of course, the greenhouse gas contribution of livestock is enormous. Um, and the human health aspect of meat-intense diets and their linkage to cardiovascular disease. Now, I work in a school of medicine. I've dedicated my whole life to studying basic molecular mechanisms that under, underlie biology. So what, what dragged me into this was an excitement about potentially impacting human health and in particular human health for the moment, in my own uh, gross, large, uh, obese country called the United States of America. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, what we're going to see is poverty uh, and obesity go hand in hand. These are maps from the Center for Disease Control uh, at Stanford, uh, in the United States, um, which maps uh, diabetes um, um, uh, rates uh, in different counties in the United States. These are the rates in 2004, these are the rates in 2008, and all you need to know is red is bad, and these are the rates in 2012. So first of all, you see an explosion in rates of diabetes. This is linked, of course, to obesity and other cardiovascular problems, but you also see a geographic concentration. Here is the map of poverty in the United States, and I, I, you don't need to be a, a genius to really see the overlay of poverty rates um, and obesity. Ironically, in our country, obesity is a disease of poverty, okay? So we're, we're feeding our population too many calories, the wrong types of nutrition, et cetera. Right? And obviously a linkage of this is to fast food. So one of my goals was, could we make plant-based meat substitutes that not only um, appealing to the consumer, 
but at a price point that we could put it into fast food restaurants. These food items cannot just be the luxury of the rich. Rich people already get good diets, right? It needs to be uh, 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 rather simple and rather inexpensive, okay? Um, and so I came into this because uh, my area of expertise is shapes and forms of biological molecules, right? And we talked a lot about proteins, plant proteins. Let's spend a moment and talk about what proteins really are. Proteins are stitched together amino acids. Those stitched together amino acids fold up into complicated shapes. Those complicated shapes are what perform the tasks, many of the tasks, uh, within a cell, okay? And what meat is, is of course an assemblage of proteins, fats, lipids, minerals, etc. Right? But what gives meat its unique properties are larger assemblies of proteins. Okay? What you see here are the fibers that make up muscle fiber, okay? which allow locomotion. So the structure of meat, what gives it its chewiness, right? its ability to be cooked, and change its consistency come from these underlying fibers, such as collagen or actin and myosin. But the reason meat has these types of fibers is because meat is muscle. The function of muscle is locomotion. These proteins form these shapes because the function of the cells that are using them is locomotion. Okay, so if we ask the question, what is meat? Of course it's a, an assemblage of individual proteins that form these fibers and threads that then turn into macroscopic meat tissue. Right? And we had to define the problem at a certain, at a certain level. Because we're not going to find the same molecules uh, in plants to get down to the molecular level. So we're going to make a compromise. The compromise is going to be, let's mimic the experience of eating meat Maybe not quite the molecular structure, but the macroscopic structure of meat, okay? And the reason is, is because we're going to use proteins from peas. The proteins that are in peas form complicated shapes, but the goal of those proteins is not locomotion. Peas aren't moving very much, right? It's storage of energy, right, for, for reproduction, right? So the proteins don't look anything like the proteins in muscle. So we have to come up with some kind of strategy to coax plant proteins into looking somewhat like muscle. And we do this at a level that I like to call the mesoscale or material scale. We want the experience not of microscopic measurement, but of measurement in by your eyes and mouth and nose when you eat a, a plant-based meat product to think you're eating meat, right? So the idea is really start with the sensory experience of eating meat. Hide all the science in the closet, because right, nobody cares about science, but really try to reproduce all the different aspects of meat using plant-based, uh, uh, various plant-based ingredients, pea protein, we use fats from plants, we use colorants that are colorants from beet and, and, and pomegranate, and try to really mimic the sensory experience. The obvious things of color, flavor, aroma, all things that are, are the experience of eating meat. But additional things, sound. We recorded frequencies of our hamburgers and made sure that they uh, reproduce the frequency spectrum of meat. The sound of meat cooking is something very appealing to people. Right? And what we came up with is, is, is a hamburger. Okay? Um, and so, you know, some of the lessons of this is, I, the goal of this was let's make it simple. Okay? Let's not over-engineer it. This is food. Let's get something good, not great perhaps, but good into the marketplace, get feedback from consumers, and then iterate, constantly improve. And that's what we've been doing for the last four years. Okay? Now, why now? Okay? Well, obviously, part of now is the desire for consumers for these types of products. But there's a confluence of genetic, biochemical, engineering approaches, knowledge, an enormous flux of knowledge and expertise um, into uh, the field of food that I think is a ripe moment for innovation. Because in my world, innovation occurs when different approaches rub against each other I, and really provide breakthroughs. Now, why did we pick hamburgers? Well, Americans eat a lot of hamburgers. The world, maybe not so much, but a 50 billion hamburgers a year is a lot of hamburgers, okay? Um, Why do we do this in California? This is just for the entrepreneurial crowd. Um, there's just a there's a there's a culture of innovation, 
You know, people are uh, encouraged to go off and start companies. You fail, big deal, try another company. There's lots of funding and venture capital uh, to allow r risks. The weather is nice. It's a nice place for young people to live. That has, that's essential for entrepreneurship. Young people are the fuel of entrepreneurship. They need to live where the innovation is. There's a great talent pool and good universities for the most part. Okay, and so what we did is we just went around uh, and I just got on the phone and hired, called all my friends. I need chemists, I need you know, biochemists, I need protein chemists, I need engineers. I, and so I, had a, I have a big Rolodex, I have smart friends, I'm not very smart myself. Hired most of the people that are under 30, right? And many of them had not worked in food before. Now that's not to say the food industry is not needed. One of my lessons is you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Right, you want to use the massive experience of the food industry to make sure you're not reproducing technologies that already exist. Um, we have Leonardo DiCaprio involved, so there's a lot of celebrities. It's in Los Angeles, the company. Um, I've never gotten to meet him. Uh, but we recently did a life cycle analysis, and as you might expect, um, the, the, the product comes out a real winner in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, water usage, land usage, and ener energy usage. And, and obviously, we're working harder to make these numbers uh, even better. Uh, and most importantly, consumers like it. Right? It's uh, really popular in lots of stores. Um, most of our consumers are meat buyers. Um, and I just want to end, as my time is up, with some lessons from the voyage, which is keep it simple. Right? Consumers don't care about science. They don't want to hear about science. They want to hear about a really good tasting product that's good for them and perhaps good for the planet as well. Um, not everything's innovation. Uh, you know, build an organization with good people, with mutual respect, and collaborate. Right? We did not do all of this on our own. We leveraged the experience of a lot of very famous food companies to have this happen. Okay? And, uh, you know, I guess I'm going to end, right? Marketing is important. Uh, all these things, all these aspects that go beyond what I think is important, I'm a scientist, is critical to the success of the company. And most critical wasn't anything we did, was putting the patties into the meat section. So our products are sold eye to eye with different meat products, right? and that's been a huge thing. So just I'll end, just because this is cute. Um, uh, you know, I've done a lot of science in my life, but the greatest honor you can have in America is be on during the Super Bowl, the big football game. And we had a commercial uh, yeah, during the Super I've Bowl. Yeah, seen a lot out here in the West. This is Carl's But King. a juicy charbroiled burger with a patty made from plants? Only the folks at Carl's Jr. can pull out something that bold. That's pretty good. All the legendary That's good flavor, flavor. None of the meat. When the wagon of change comes, you ride along with it. The new Beyond Famous Star with Cheese, only at Carl's Jr., where the food Carl's is Jr. the is star. Carl's Jr. is the best food restaurant in the United States. So um, I'll end with a few quotes of people I admire. So thank you very much. Under 30. Ninety-five percent of new food and beverage products fail, like all of these. That's because the market is more competitive than ever before, and consumer preference for flavor, aroma, and texture is constantly evolving. But the food and beverage industry doesn't have a way to consistently develop products that meet changing consumer preference. Until now. I'm Jason Cohen founder and CEO of Analytical Flavor Systems. We're the company behind Gastrograph AI, the first artificial intelligence platform that models human sensory perception to predict consumer preference. We make our predictions by entirely separating perception, what someone perceives in a product, across a range of demographic factors, like age, sex, race, socioeconomic status, past tasting experience, and smoking habits, and then modeling their prep preferences, what they like and dislike today, and predicting the evolution of their preferences into the future. We use this technology to help food and beverage companies develop new products, optimize existing brands, and enter new markets. Here's how it works. First, 
we build our models in four steps. First, we translate perception between different demographics. Second, we model flavor hierarchically. Third, we predict preferences today. And fourth, we predict the evolution of preferences into the future. Translating perception is important because you never have a truly stratified random sampling of a homogenous and IID population. The human population is not homogenous. We're not independently and identically distributed. Human sensory perceptions or sensitivity levels are not normally distributed across the population. So if you're using traditional product development techniques, all of your sample statistics are wrong. We get around that by just like Google Translate can translate French into Chinese or Chinese into Italian, we can take data from any given demographic and translate it into any target demographic. And to do that, we train the AI on its own bit of math that we call metric learning, which we use for locality and covariance preserving projections. And as an example of this, let's say that we have three different demographics represented as triangles, circles, and squares. The triangles can be Americans, the circles can be British, and the squares are, of course, Germans. If we're interested in developing a product for the German demographic, we can take all of our triangle and circle data and translate that into the square perception. And what that gives us is a more robust distribution for how that demographic perceives flavor and a higher resolution insight into exactly what they're tasting. So once we have this translation layer built, we don't actually need the target demographic on the panel. So if we're developing products, say, in New York, and we only have American and British tasters, we can still predict what the German population will taste, or any other target demographic. The second step is hierarchical modeling. So we think of every flavor, aroma, and texture as a signature. And these signatures can exist at any level of abstraction. You can have the five basic flavors, like sweet, bitter, salty, sour, umami, are all signatures. You can have categorical signatures, like fruity, earthy, herbaceous, roasted nuts and seeds. You can have subcategorical, like citrus, is a signature, or specific, like lemon, or very specific, Meyer lemon, or very, very specific, Meyer lemon zest. These are all signatures. And so what the AI is actually doing is it's modeling flavor as an infinite dimensional Hilbert space where every signature is a topologically invariant nested subspace. And that has a very intuitive understanding. What it means is that we know that Meyer lemon is entirely encompassed by lemon, is entirely encompassed by citrus, is entirely encompassed by fruits. And maybe lemon and orange are close together, or maybe they're far apart, but we know that they must be further apart than all of the various types of oranges in the orange sphere, like blood orange, sumo orange, and navel orange. And in fact, some of those oranges can even be overlapping, which means that certain segments of the population can't tell the difference between them. And so what this allows us to do is predict up and down the resolution curve. So if I'm a super experienced citrus taster and I say I'm definitely tasting Meyer lemon zest and someone else on the panel is only able to say I'm tasting citrus, what this can do is it can determine if we're at different points in flavor space or if we're at the same point in flavor space and just describing the product differently. And that allows us to predict present but unidentified flavors. So in any given product, there's going to be 20 or 30 or 40 different flavors. But it's usually very difficult, even for a professional taster, to be able to name more than five flavors, sometimes more than 10 flavors. And so there's always going to be flavors that are present, but no one has identified. So what we can do is we can actually learn the topological signature of something like strawberry. We've seen strawberry in over 10,000 on-market products. We've seen it in coffee. We've seen it in chocolate. We've seen it uh, in ice cream. And we can learn what that signature looks like across a variety of contexts. And then we can use something like a signal detection algorithm to predict the prep presence of strawberry even when no one has been able to identify it. And what that allows us to do is decompose a flavor profile into all of its relative constituent parts. So something like 2% strawberry, 1% grapefruit, 3% lemon. And that altogether allows us to model the interactions between signatures. So we've identified 750 signatures to date. We're identifying about a new signature per week. And what this is doing is it allows us to understand the tensor, the interaction between all of the various combinations of flavor. And we can use it to predict a new combination. And so that is how we predict preferences today. Any one of those signatures is moving through a different preference state at a time. You can have emergent preferences where the relative value of that signature is increasing over time, stable preferences where they're holding stable, declining preferences or fads, where demand for a signature spikes and then falls. And so when we need to predict the perception, the preference for a new product or a product that we've never seen before, or a product that might be entirely algorithmic, might be under development, what we can do is we can take that flavor profile decomposition from all of the products in our database, construct a robust preference gradient, the, inter the preferences based on the interaction of flavors, and we can use entirely unrelated data like a citrus IPA to predict preferences for a Rwandan coffee. Because what we've learned is that preferences are contextual. 
right? When someone says that they like lemon, they don't actually mean that they like lemon. They like a certain intensity of lemon modified by other flavor, A, B, C, and D. And so while biting into a whole lemon is far too sour for this poor little girl, she would love a lemonade. And because we understand preference and context, we can actually build up an algebra on flavor. So this is an example of applied semantic vectors. The idea is that all words encode for meaning. You can take a set of terms like mother, mom, and mommy that all refer to the same thing, that all mean the same thing, but they vary along some context or some axis. That context could be age of the speaker, where mother is used by older individuals and mommy is used by younger individuals. It could be formality, where mother is most formal and mommy is least formal, or it could be a combination of those axes and any other number of axes. And when you develop enough of these axes, you can actually do math on words. You can say something like king minus man plus woman equals queen. And so we can actually do the same thing on flavor. We can take a flavor profile of a product that actually exists, product one, at a known distribution of preference, and we could say minus lime plus lemon and predict the new perception and the new preference without any further wet chemistry formulation or tasting. We can do this entirely algorithmically. And in fact, we can do this up to five levels deep, so up to five different signatures at a time, which allow us to iterate anywhere through, through a few hundred thousand to over a million unique combinations of flavor. And we can use that to predict a market topography and a topology of preference. And that allows us to predict new high competitive flavor profiles in targeted white space so that we know where and how products are going to be preferred and where they're going to be preferred. And so the final step is it's no longer enough to develop a product that's preferred today. You now have to develop a product that's going to be preferred in six months or a year or two years into the future so that that product has a, li a lifespan. And what we found is that preferences are an emergent property of the flavors that are prevalent on the market today. Just as you'd expect someone who grew up in South Korea to result in different preferences with fermented and spicy food to result in different preferences than someone who grows up in Paris or London, uh, Milan or New York, right? It's the food that you grow up with, the flavors that you're taught are good, that influence your consumption decisions throughout life, that crystallize into your preferences later in life. And this is true at a micro level where we're each going through our own consumer journey, but it's also true at a macro level where entire cohorts of consumers are exposed to similar flavors, make their consumption decisions from a similar set of products and crystallize into a similar bit of, bit of preferences. And as an example of this, North America, particularly the United States, has recently undergone an emergent to stable preference transition for bitter. Products in North America are more bitter than they've ever been before. We're drinking black coffees, IPAs, drink, eating dark chocolate. We've even moved from things like fruit flavored parfaits to things like Greek yogurt. We're now in the early stages of an emergent to stable preference transition for sour. Products are becoming more sour than they've ever been before. We're moving from IPAs to sour beers, black coffee to lightly roasted black coffee, dark chocolate to things like Curacao and Cororo varieties of more fruity and citric chocolate, uh, and even moving from things like Greek yogurt to things like Icelandic yogurt, each of which are more bitter and sour than the, the generation of products before it. And as an example of this at the micro level, we could see that the preferences of grapefruit in 2015 to 2016 were quite neutral. But in 2016 to 2017, the preference gradient shifted and grapefruit became more preferred products with grapefruit became more preferred without them changing anything else at all. And this is a cherry-picked example because grapefruit is both bitter and sour, but it's a good example of how this can have an effect on the micro level. It can also have an effect on the macro level, where meeting consumer preference can create markets worth billions. So kombucha is a 250-year-old Russian beverage. It was available in local hippie bookstores across the United States. Eight years ago, sales of kombucha was so small there was no trade association tracking it. Now it's on track to be a billion-dollar industry. And it's not because the kombucha companies thought it was a good idea to make more kombucha. There, was, there were no kombucha companies, right? It was because there was pent up demand for bitter and sour flavors. So you have the bitter herbaceous tea, the organic sour acid, and now you have something on track to be a billion dollar industry just by meeting consumer preference. And so the question that we want to help you answer is what comes next? Cheers. Hi everybody, good afternoon. My name is Eshkhar Ben Shitrit from Israel. A year and a half ago I quit my job because I was hungry and I looked for something good to eat. And now I'm going to tell you the story and where we are today. So, so meat is an obsession of humankind. And I know that because it was my obsession for many, many years. But four years ago I had my first son and I stopped eating meat suddenly. I stopped eating meat because I realized that for me personally, it's very hard to eat something that was a living creature before that, 
And then I went to a journey of how to replace my obsession with meat to something else that I can eat. And through this journey, I also discovered that meat is actually destroying our planet because we are using our resources in such a terrible way, feeding it to animals in order to create food. So the worst thing that we are doing today to the environment and the planet is actually growing beef for human consumption. And when you look at what is beef, there is a lot of elements that people are working on today. And we heard a lot of innovation. We heard even the best company now in the world beyond meat working on replacing meat from animals from other meat. But actually, when you think about what is meat, what makes the experience that was mentioned here of meat, you think about one thing, and I personally think about one thing. The holy grail of meat is actually the complete muscle, or what we call steak. Because this is probably the most simple food product you can imagine. You put it on the grill, and you fry it for a few minutes on each side, but it's so perfect. And this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a way to have the same experience of eating steaks, which I stopped four years ago. What am we doing about it? We are redefining what is meat by introducing a new technology to create meat, something that doesn't come from the food industry, but helps to address all of the problems that make alternative meat not as close to meat. So we have three basic principles of our technology, which each of its own is very, very complicated. When you bring them together, you have a final result. The patent pending technology that we, are, we have developed starts from a 3D model of meat. Nobody developed a 3D model of meat because nobody needed a 3D model of meat. But now when we're trying to create what is in meat, you need to understand how meat is comprised and create a 3D model that anticipates what will be the taste, what will be the texture, what will be the flavor, how it will cook on a grill. Then we take our understanding of what we're trying to build from a 3D model and we find formulations from natural plant-based ingredients that can receive the properties we want to achieve. But what's unique about what we are doing, we look separately on a formulation for muscle, a formulation for fat, and a formulation for blood. Because if you look at meat, that's essentially what you have there. And if you want to redefine meat, you need to also look at how you recreate this structure. And finally, and this is most important and most interesting, but it's only one piece of the puzzle, we are the first company in the world who are actually working on a 3D printer for food. So we are not taking an existing 3D printer and we're trying to use it for food. We started by saying, what is a 3D printer of food? And what is a 3D printer for food? It's not like a 3D printer that needs to print plastic. It's not like a 3D printer that needs to print metal. It's a printer that needs to digitally change texture, digitally change flavor, digitally change the perception of a food product. And we have built a very simple version of this machine, and we are working now on the first version that will be an industrial 3D printing for food. In order to do that, you cannot just start with food technology, because what we are doing is bringing technology outside of the food world into the food world. We have a very strong team that brings together chefs, food engineers, but also mechanical engineers and designers. We have advisors that have a lot of experience in the food industry, and when you bring together a multidisciplinary and a diverse team to tackle a problem that nobody tackled before, 3D printing of alternative meat, you can have innovation very fast. Because sometimes the ideas that we have come from the pharmaceutical world, the medical device world, the polymer science world. But more important, we are trying to do probably one of the biggest, most important things for humanity, as I see it, but one of the most difficult technological challenges that exist today. We decided to partner. We decided to find the right partners that can help us redefine meat. The first thing that we did in order to understand meat, we asked ourselves, who really knows meat? Who is really intimate with meat? Is it chefs? Is it farmers? Is it retailers? No. Actually, the butchers are the ones that have the most understanding. Because in many, many cases, especially in Europe, Butcher is a family business. So our partner, Olivier Metzger from France, he is 50 years old. He says he has 50 years of experience in meat. And with him, we are working on understanding what is meat, what makes you enjoy meat. What is the difference between Wagyu beef that is consumed in the USA and Wagyu beef that is consumed in Japan? What is the difference between a ribeye of Angus and a fillet steak of Angus in order to create different 3D models that will represent each and any one of them? The other part, we said 
the deep science. What are proteins from plants? What is the measurement of texture within a matrix of meat? This is something that the Academy is working on. So we are working with Israel leading food technology and biotechnology uh, department in the Technion. And last, flavor is a very, very important component of the experience of eating meat. And we are not a flavor expert. We partner with Givodan, and we have been working with Givodan for the past six months in order to improve our formulation and to improve the human experience that is meat. This is some of our experiences with Olivier Metzger, the butcher, going literally into meat. And it's very hard for me because I don't eat meat, but this is the way to learn. And we started a year and a half ago with an idea. In the past month, we were able to serve 150 people in Israel, in restaurants, meat that doesn't come from animals. Why do I say meat that doesn't come from animals? Because I said it, and the gentleman from Beyond said it, Meat is a human experience. So if you experience something that tastes like meat and looks like meat, and you enjoy it like meat, why does it need to come from a dead animal? And the last thing that we did, a few weeks ago in Israel, we had a chance to present our technology in front of a very nice group of people. And they told us, do you want to have a stand to talk about your technology and give samples? And we said, no, we are doing technology, but we are doing food technology. So let's put the food in front. And I want to show you in a very quick video how we chose to do it and what were the results. We're getting ready for the XPRIZE Innovation Board dinner. We are here next to really high-end premium meat dishes and we're trying to blend right in, serving them 100 redefined kebabs as meat. Kebab was like a kebab that I expected. It was an authentic kebab tasting. It's really good. The texture was really good. The taste is really good. It's got the texture. It's got the flavor. It's got an aftertaste to it. I would say that it was uh, actually one of the better kebabs I've ever tasted. So, well done. It's not meat. It's actually vegan. It's plant-based. Really? It tasted exactly like meat. In fact, I thought it was meat. And I eat meat all the time. It was terrific. You cannot really differentiate it from uh, natural meat. I'm a vegetarian. I was actually worried. Is this really <laughs> not meat? Uh, so I was pleasantly surprised. As a meat eater, it's really tasty. You cook it like meat. It smells like meat on the grill. And it tastes like meat. That's absolutely fantastic. The taste experience is perfect. I mean, it's, it's indistinguishable. I came over and I said, listen, I don't eat meat, I'm, I'm, I'm vegan. And then you said, but guess what? It's a vegan meat, it's, and, and it's amazing. It, is, it tastes fantastic. I want another one, please. <laughs> so people will not stop eating meat, and we need to find ways for people to eat meat coming from a different direction. And somebody asked me before I went on stage, she told me I loved meat, I love meat, so uh, I can't support your cause, but I love meat as well. And what we are doing is actually creating new kinds of meat because we love meat. And the reason is very simple. You can hear a lot of the problems in the food supply chain, lack of resources, waste, treating the planet in a bad way, treating animals in a bad way. If you want to redefine the food supply chain, we need to start to redefine meat because meat is the embodiment of everything is broken in the food supply chain, but we are so in love with it. And our goal is to continue redefining meat and bringing more and more products, high quality steaks and other kind of beef products to the market in Europe in a year and a half from now. And we started already today to test it with real people around Israel. Thank you very much. Good morning, good evening to everyone. I am uh, Elena Sgravati. I'm the CEO of uh, the Biotech, the Better Biotech, which is uh, a green innovative startup uh, based uh, in uh, Italy and uh, part of Serial Docs uh, Group. We are here today to talk about uh, botanicals, and we will start to talk about them uh, uh, with a game because I will uh, show you in a rapid sequence uh, uh, three images 
but I hope to help you to be useful for you to try to consider differently our existence in relation with botanical. So we start. The third. Well, what do you remember now? If I ask you, maybe the most part of you will remember a bear, a phone, and a man. And maybe have forgotten the vast majority of the slide which was occupied by plants. Why did uh, it happen? Because uh, we are human, we are prey, and so we recognize the danger. We are even predator, and we recognize the phone. But we are also human, and so we recognize the man, because we have the ancestral need to belong to humanity, to a community, to a social community. However, we are fascinating. We are, in my company, we are all mad for plants, really. We are all mad for plants, because uh, plants are absolutely fantastic uh, organism. And consider the biomass, uh, the global biomass occupied by plant uh, is around, is considered around from 95% up to 99%. So we wonder who is really the dominant, the dominator, are human or are vegetal? This is a good question. And plants are absolutely pioneering organisms. They are more evoluted than we are perceiving. They are spend less en energy than they are producing. They are autotrophy. They are organisms living without any vital organs, so they can be uh, eaten by animals and they survive. We have to uh, learn by them. We are individual, individual, and consider that the term individual comes from the Latin term which means uh, not uh, divisible. They can survive even if eaten, as I said, and for this reason they are more evolutive than when we consider. And for this reason, uh, we can use uh, their potentiality. Consider that the one from one cell, we can produce uh, a whole individual, a whole organism, a whole plant, just from one cell. And this is uh, something that belongs exclusively to the vegetal world, to the plant. It's impossible. It's something that only vegetal cells uh, have, uh, this potentiality, is uh, named totipotency, okay? And this is something that uh, we will use uh, and we use in our company with intelligence uh, because we follow the natural behavior of the plant. Plants are very sophisticated because, uh, of course, uh, uh, consider that Aristotle was claiming that the plants are uh, inferior organisms. While they are not so inferior, they are very sophisticated because, and I am uh, conscious that an, I'm not saying a news, but plants have the roots. Uh, and this condition of fixity in the land uh, force them to, to react, uh, to communicate with uh, other plants. Uh, uh, when they have to produce uh, flavor, odor to attract insects, or when they have to defend themselves from the attacks of uh, uh, pathogens and so on. So they have put in place many sophisticated uh, um, strategies to survive. And we have to learn from them. Consider that uh, uh, plants, because uh, their fixity, are uh, able to produce uh, very complex molecules that even the best chemist is not able to produce. Very complex and uh, difficult to be synthesized, of course. And those molecules that you see 
are made uh, through very uh, complex uh, biochemical way in response uh, to attack of uh, pathogen of uh, many uh, physical or chemical parameters that the plants are able to recognize almost 20 physical different parameters and these uh, uh, product, uh, these metabolites, uh, secondary metabolites, are produced by the plant to defend itself, uh, are those compounds that are even very useful for us, for, uh, for us, and we are not able to produce. So we need to use them, this sophisticated mechanism of production, because they are very helpful to keep in health human and animal. So we depend on the plant. And this is something that we have to bear in mind more and more. We depend on the plant. We are not dominating the plant. We depend on the plant. And this is the reason why uh, even uh, WHO recommended uh, to uh, eat uh, almost uh, five servings uh, per day of fruit and vegetable with different colors because they provide very antioxidant, uh, anti-inflammatory compounds that are very useful to keep us in health. The point is uh, that has been mentioned before, even my, from uh, uh, the, the, um, the speaker before, the problem is that uh, the agriculture with the, the incre increase of population, 10 million, billion of people in uh, 2050, has to produce more and more, 70% more, in a very hostile condition. And this is a big problem. In hostile condition, climate change, many pathologies, and so on. With the need and the request of health, which is growing and growing. So, how to tackle this problem? Well, to be honest, uh, FAO was uh, recommended uh, since uh, 1994. The solution was uh, saying, well, you have a, a very well-known technology, which was used, uh, honestly speaking, for pharmaceutical products, uh, which uh, are named uh, plant cell culture, so in vitro culture, which provides a very, very highly qualitative standards products uh, with no pesticide, minimizing uh, availability prob product problems. And so, what do we do in the metabiotech? We have developed a platform which is named CROP, which is the acronym of uh, optimized uh, control release of optimized plant. And from a piece, a small piece uh, of uh, vegetal tissue that can be a leaf, a piece of leaf, a bud, or a seed, appropriately sterilized and put in a condition, appropriate condition, which is uh, sugar, and uh, mineral salts and water grow because naturally the cells grow even because, uh, because uh, this is a, a peculiarity of the plant and we can ferment it in fermenter, growing and grow the fermenter even more uh, larger to obtain a final product uh, which is completely uh, free of pesticide because we cultivate it uh, in very controlled environment or solvents, providing the three main uh, um, uh, features in terms of quality, safety, availability, and uh, standardization. So providing 100% uh, quality by process, which is something which is very uh, difficult to achieve. Moreover, the theme of sustainability is uh, provided. Uh, we are able to save uh, something as a three times fold, one ton of water instead of 1,000 of tons, of tons of water. One square meter instead with of uh, 1,000 square meters. And uh, providing products uh, with no seasonality and doing uh, in a week what uh, the uh, nature, what uh, the plant uh, does in uh, months or even in year. But what we do? 
Uh, for example, we are doing, we have in our pipeline, uh, and uh, we are close to, uh, to the market, to enter in the market with two in interesting, we believe, uh, products as uh, uh, rosmarinic acid. You know that uh, there is a big uh, demand, a big need, a met need of uh, preservatives for a clean label no artificial preservative and rosmarinic acid is normally extracted with solvent from a, a traditional cultivated plant with a problem of uh, flavor of taste of odor and of course of sustainability well with this technology we are able to provide a, a natural preservative natural preservative with the odorless flavor uh, flavorless that uh, does uh, their its uh, action as preservative, but it is also functional preservative because it's helpful for the, your health. So it's doing uh, even something good, not only preservative, as well as for the red carrot. Uh, in our lab, we have uh, um, we have uh, uh, selected. Uh, a uh, red carrot that uh, is able to be to provide a very brilliant red but is stable to the light and to the temperature two big problem last but not least we have still in the market uh, one uh, botanicals which is echinacea purpurea echinacea has uh, many many problems in terms of uh, um, sophistication, uh, adulteration, and uh, um, adulterant, of, of course. And we are able to produce, we have registered it uh, without any problems, of course, of uh, we have a product that uh, have any problems in terms of pesticide, solvents, uh, and uh, is uh, highly standardized. But Apart from the product that we have in, in the pipeline, I think that, uh, I hope that we have tried to, uh, to change your perception on uh, how important is uh, the, the, the world the plant. And uh, I hope that uh, with my presentation, we try even to give you a flavor that is possible to produce highly qualitative standard product uh, in a very sustainable way for a better future for us, for our generation, but even more for the future generation. Thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute privilege to be on stage after such amazing speakers. Um, thank you to all come before me, and thank you to the diehards who are in the room and are staying to the end. The requirement for sustainable protein and the requirement to change what we eat is founded in the compelling reality that we cannot carry on doing the things we're doing. The compelling reality and the ugly truth that is highlighted to us by a 15-year-old Swedish girl and which highlights the need for technology to, as a solution. My name is Jim Laird, I'm the CEO of 3F Bio, and we are focused on addressing that solution for sustainable protein. As our populations grow and our diets change, the growth and the demand for protein creates both the, one of the world's largest markets and also one of the world's largest challenges. I believe in biotechnology and, speci or technology and specifically biotechnology as a solution to that because I see it as one of the most sustainable solutions, as has already been highlighted, and also because it's one of the most scalable solutions. Because I believe in sustainability, I can't hide from the fact that just as actress Emma Thompson was challenged for flying across Atlantic business class to a climate protest in London, whether or not my, my flight this morning from London is fully justified alongside my sustainability aims is indeed challengeable. I see the numbers that my flight today was 160 kilograms of carbon, which I think is a lot. The amazing thing for me is one recent Austrian and Dutch study, if I was consuming Brazilian beef, says that's only equivalent to four quarter pounders. And maybe more conservatively, if I was looking at European beef, my flight this morning is 10 quarter pounders. I will assure you that I won't, I won't be eating the quarter pounders in Italy today. I think this does highlight the need for change. Whichever way we look at it, the, meat, meat, the demand for meat is currently met by animals, 
and 99% coming from livestock. We slaughter 200 million animals on a daily basis. These account for a quarter of our water usage, a quarter of our land use, somewhere between 15 and 20% of our carbon emissions. And for me, the most stark fact, in the US, more than 80% of antibiotic use is, arise, is, is caused by from, uh, farming of livestock. This is not sustainable. So if we look at the numbers, the continued, we look at the numbers, the market for protein, roughly 500 million tons. And as we've seen before, 99% of this is from livestock. Elena has eloquently championed the role of plants, but currently plant-based accounts for less than 1%. And we cannot be, continue to be overly reliant on the animal. As we see the change, I think it's undoubtedly true that the demand for meat and the, per, and the kilogram consumption of meat will continue to grow. But it's also undoubtedly true that experts align generally in the view that somewhere between 20 and 50% of this market will be met by plant protein in the fullness of time. That creates 100 to 150 million tons per annum of new demand in plant protein, and it compels the need for technology as a solution in that area. So to introduce 3F Bio, our purpose is to tackle this market need, and we believe that our technology is first disruptive to initiate this change, and is also scalable to fulfill the promise of this change that we all need. I'm going to grab two minutes of your time to play a video to explain what we do, and then come on to look at it in more detail. How can we produce protein sustainably? It's one of the most important questions of the 21st century. As a biotech company, 3F Bio believes that a combination of technology and natural processes provide the efficient manufacturing solutions that are at the core of sustainability. In recent years, to address the need for sustainable protein, there has been a growing focus on alternatives to intensive livestock production, such as protein from insects or creating lab-grown meat. 3F Bio has developed another way. We make a proven product, mycoprotein, more efficiently than is currently possible. We do this with technology and a zero waste process, IP that was developed over 2013 and 14. A successful proof of concept led to the creation of 3F Bio in 2015 and was followed by funding in 2017 and 18. Our technology creates a new zero waste integrated process by linking a first generation biorefinery and a large scale fermentation process. The individual processes have been proven at scale for decades, with a plant fermenting mycoprotein at Teesside in the UK and over 300 first-generation biorefineries across Europe and North America. The timescale for our technology has seen successful demonstration in the lab in 2016 and 2017 and piloting in 2018. It will now progress to a demo-scale pilot in early 2019, with the aim to have industrial capacity in place by 2020 and 2021. The lab work took place in Scotland's Industrial Biotech Innovation Centre. We worked initially at 15 litre batch scale to validate the concept and then progressed to continuous operation to inform the scale up process. During 2018, we completed piloting at Biobase Europe in Ghent, where we have successfully produced food grade materials based on both glucose and feedstock from our lead site. With food grade product, we can now begin commercial development. 3F BioChefs are prototyping different applications to help our future partners understand our product's possibilities. The next stage of development will take place in early 2019, progressing to TRL7 with an integrated, continuous operation that uses a skid pilot facility with capacity for 1 to 2 tonnes per week. And the final stage of technology development will be to work with leading engineering and industrial partners, aiming to provide a scalable solution to growing protein needs by 2020. Make more with less with Abunda Mycoprotein. So our product is mycoprotein, and it has to come back to the food. Nobody eats technology, everybody eats a food. And in the picture on the right, what you see in it is our food, and it looks a bit like a chicken mince. We've made a range of products with this, beef style, chicken style, and we see the versatility in it. To talk about the benefits of our product, it starts with being delicious and versatile, and delicious because of its texture and because of absence of aftertaste. It is highly functional and nutritious, containing a wide range of functional attributes, and it is, for what we see, the most sustainable and scalable source of protein. For us, taste comes first. It has no aftertaste, 
and a fibrous texture that mimics meat. And you see some examples of sausages, similar to what I think Jody has shown earlier, chicken style, beef style, extending wider to noodles and to some dairy applications. As a B2B ingredient, we will develop this within, with partners, recognizing that their scale and their innovation capability could dwarf what we could do alone. Secondly, it is nutritious and functional. It is a whole biomass that contains complete protein, high in fiber, zero cholesterol and trans fats, and less than 2% fat. And finally, and maybe for me the most important part, is sustainability and its scalability. Jody's talked about sustainability and the metrics of carbon emissions, water use, land use. And we see equivalence. In water, it is less than 50% of pea in soy, and maybe less than 90% less than meat alternatives. In feed conversion, and for feed conversion, I see this as the biggest source of scalability and sustainability. Our feed conversion, again, is 50% better than plant alternatives, and a factor of five to 10 times better than meat alternatives. And in scalability, and again, that come back to that challenge of something has to produce 100 million tons of scalable protein. The scalability of this technology, if it was bolted on to every biorefinery in North America and Europe, equates to around about 50 million tons per year. So as a summary, we can improve the way we grow our food, and we do it using biotechnology. Biotech starts with the advantage of growing feed, food with small organisms and advantaged feed conversion. Combining this with a zero waste process lowers the cost, and by producing a product with proven market acceptance, fundamentally I believe we can change what we eat, but we do not necessarily have to change the way we eat. Thank you very much. I think that concludes our afternoon. 3F Bio is here. We'll be on the EIT stand this afternoon and, uh, and again tomorrow. And if there's any questions, we're very happy to take them then. Thank you all.